Hello, hello. Hello, folks. Just wait another minute and I'll get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Really pleased to have you here. And I really hope you've been enjoying um, the Tiny House Conference to date. And, uh, you know, you've been learning or getting some really good information from the other speakers. Uh, really hope that's the case. I'm going to get started. And so I'm Janine Strawn and I'm the president of the Australian Tiny House Association. And it's my pleasure to speak to you here again at the US Tiny House Conference. I spoke uh, at this conference back in March, I think it was, of 2021. And at that stage, I spoke about what's happening in in Australia in the tiny houses and tiny houses down under, and um, you know it was a really enjoyed that experience. And and I was uh, approached to come and speak again. And for this for today, what I'm going to be talking to you about is the Australian Tiny House Construction Guide. This guide is um, it, it is. There is text, but I'm trying to improve it. I'm trying to also incorporate uh, pictures as well so we can hopefully, uh, so that it can, uh, right, so that it can, um, you know, be interest, interesting to you as well. What I'd like to do is um, answer any questions towards the end of the presentation just so I'm not stop starting and also hand over the mic if anybody wants to ask me a, either put a question in the chat or certainly if you want to ask me a question verbally, um, you know, please feel free, you know, to do that as well. Engagement is really important. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, incorporate or I, I teach online as well. So, you know, I really like the feedback from people and, um, you know, I hope that you'll find what I've got to say interesting and informative. All right, so... Um, Without further ado, I will get the screen ready, the presentation ready. And Zach, I know that you're there. Could you just confirm, please, that you can see the screen for me? Can you just tell me? Yeah, we can see it. We can Great, thank you. Just go back a couple. Just go back one more. Okay. Great. Hmm. All right. So yes, I'm I'm the president of the Australian Tiny House Association, and so it's, it's a pleasure to be in that role. And we are a voluntary association. We're made up of. Um, we've got a strong committee. We're, there's, we've got a committee of, of 16. Uh, we've, that's made up of an executive committee um, of four people, the, the first four people, myself, a vi vice president, secretary and a treasurer. We've got other um, committee members, membership, digital brand, campaign coordinator events, and then we've got all of our amazing state leads that are people who help us at the state level help to communicate what our message is and help to promote uh, the legalisation of tiny house living. So it's only fairly um, a young association. We've been established in 2018 by five enthusiasts um, who had a passion for uh, movable tiny houses and, and um, they were all either tiny house builders or they were wanting to live tiny or help to in, enhance um, and embrace the tiny house sector in Australia. Obviously, several of them had actually, our, the president, the original president had gone over to the US 
and done a, a significant tour around the US to sort of see what was happening, you know, on your shores in the tiny house sector. We are a membership association and it's based on builders and dwellers. So dwellers are the people who are occupying the tiny houses, but also enthusiasts, people who see um, that the tiny house sector um, or the tiny houses can be an alternative, a legitimate alternative housing solution. That's what we're striving to achieve here. So they may never aspire, they may never want to live tiny, but they support others in their choice to live tiny. It's really important to note that we are not a regulatory or a certification body. Our mission is to, is to find a national approach that overcomes the regulatory hurdles preventing Australians from living in movable tiny houses, and that's what our focus is. So in Australia, we are fortunate to actually have one national construction guide, and that governs all the construction of all buildings. And that focuses on buildings that are secured to the ground and the foundation has to be engineered designed amongst other building elements. You know, your, your, your framing, your roofing system, the concrete that you use, the steel that you use in the house, um, a separation of rooms and room use and energy efficiency and bushfire management and, you know, an absolute plethora of building elements are considered or incorporated in the National Construction Code. From a residential house perspective, so such as what we call low-rise dwellings, they're focused on, um, they're covered in what we call Volume 2 of the National Construction Code and what we're blessed with is that it's actually free um, previous to um, being president, I was actually involved, I was in a senior management role at the, at the um, Housing Industry Association for many, many years. And, you know, we were always advocating for these documents to be freely available. Why should people have to pay for them? Eventually, the Australian Building Codes Board, who, who oversees this, made them freely available, which is great. So you can, you can download them here. You just need to provide a registration and then log in and download these. <clears throat> However, there is a big disconnect, there is a bit of a disconnect because if you remember what I said earlier, the foundation also needs to be engineered designed. Now in Australia, for a tiny house, uh, for trailers, they actually don't need to be engineered designed when under 4.5 tonnes. So I'm going to be talking terminology um, from a, an Australian terminology. So, you know, forgive me for, you know, the kilometres and the tonnes and the, the metres and those sorts of things, but that's obviously what we, what we work on here. So when it's under 4.5 tonnes, if it's a trailer being used on the road, it does not need to be engineered designed or certified. Um, now that's obviously a disconnect from the Australian, from the National Construction Code, where they the foundations do need to be engineered designed. So there are no standards for tiny house construction. There's actually no standards, you know, that we can build to um, that are unique for tiny houses on wheels or tiny houses on skids, and I'll talk about that a little bit further. There's been no guidance on how roofs and walls and trailers are connected and securely to withstand the wind pressure exposed whilst you're travelling on a highway at 90 or 100 k's. And that's a potentially dangerous situation. And we don't want other road users to be um, impacted uh, uh, through a failure of tiny houses being poorly constructed tiny house on wheels being poorly constructed and me being moved and then they fall apart on the highway. Nobody wants that, okay? And at the same time, we also, but but we also need to recognise that the amount of wind, um, at wind pressure being imposed on the sides and the roof and the connection systems between the trailer to the walls to the roof is absolutely critical. But there is no guide currently that, that provides, there is, sorry, Prior to our guide, there, is, there was no guidance on how those connections are made. So a movable tiny house could be built, though, to achieve a building permit, but it has to clear the hurdles that outlined above, which is what I mentioned before about the, the engineer design foundations, and also have a building sur a surveyor sign off on it. So we know that we can actually get building uh, tiny movable tiny houses 
when they're secured to the ground through, you know, diamond piers or screw piers or even concrete pads and, and, and anchored to the ground, once they're anchored to the ground, then we can try to get a, we can get building permits for them. However, that comes with it other implications, which is the the building permit is issued to the landholder, not to the owner of the tiny house. And so, if they are different, then you've got to make sure that you've actually got um, a legal agreements for land use and through a a tenancy agreement or some sort of land security agreement so that the that the landowner doesn't claim the tiny house down the track. They're different. There's a whole different story, though. So the movable nature also causes difficulty for the range of climate zones and thermal comfort, exactly what you guys are experiencing there. You may be building in Florida, but you might move it up to Oregon and you might move it up to, you know, other, you know, parts of your country. We are both very large countries, you know, and from a landmass perspective, you know, from east to west to north to south, extremely different environments. And then you've got your altitude, you know, um, in that as well. So, again, very, very cold environments. We Obviously, we're not as cold as you. Um, you know, our, our cold regions are nowhere near as cold as yours, but we need to keep that in mind. And, again, in parts of your, you know, the west coast, Bushfire prone areas. We have, you know, your West Coast bushfire prone areas. In our parts of our southeastern region of Australia, we have the highest, one of the highest bushfire prone areas in the world, just like in California. However, only two years ago, 2019, 2020, on one day alone, we actually had 719 bushfires occurring right across Australia in every single state of Australia. So we know that we need to be aware of that wherever we're going to be placing our, our um, tiny houses. <clears throat> so in mid-2020, um, Atha was approached by just a few tiny house enthusiasts to say, hey, there's an opportunity to um, submit something called a proposal for, for change. So the submission process that goes into the review of the National Construction Code. The National Construction Code gets reviewed every three years. And if you miss out on that opportunity, you don't even get consideration for it until the next three-year period. Uh, we looked at it, we explored it. Just at the 11th hour, we pulled our construction guide out of the process because we were advised that once we submit the construction guide through the, um, through, through, through the Australian Building Codes Board proposal for change, that we lose all control of it. They could go and, and increase the recommendations or the clauses and we didn't really feel comfortable about that at that stage <clears throat> and we wanted to make sure that, that we can test what we've written before we have it incorporated if, if that was the pathway. Now, I have said that we can actually build tiny houses to the National Construction Code with approval, with a permit. So is a proposal for change really necessary? Perhaps not, but there are some barriers. So it's felt that in the inclusion of the NCC with dispensations, we could incorporate dispensations for movable tiny houses because there are things that we can't accommodate. So what happened was we established a builder reference group and we had about six different builders that worked with me and um, all together <clears throat> to develop this future, this guide. So it is only focused and recognises tiny houses on wheels as well as skids as habitable dwellings. It is not focused on the tiny houses on permanent foundations in regards to, um, you know, not on skids or, or trailers. Okay, the guide sets out recommendations for the design and construction of the thou and the thos and refers to the relevant provisions of the NCC. Where I talk about that, I'll skip over it because otherwise I'd have to go back and I'll just note it there because this is what the, it is based on. The appendix, we've also got appendices and they relate to siting and the moving of the tiny houses and the guide is promoted by AFA to tiny house builders, DIYs, aspiring tiny house occupants to encourage the safe and structurally sound construction practice and assist where local authority approvals are being sought. 
we want to throughout this year and obviously you know we in Australia are you know I'm in now the most locked down you know well I'm, I'm out of Melbourne but we're the most locked down city in the world now um, from a COVID perspective but you know other areas of other areas of Australia are doing okay and New South Wales and Victoria for us are doing it hard again but our numbers are our COVID vaccinations are going up and so hopefully we'll start to get more freedom with more freedom comes more people you know striving to build their own tiny house and 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 so on as well as we all know the impacts of COVID and homelessness the increase of homelessness and so that's what we really focused on as well making sure that this is occurring so we focused on, we're defining a movable tiny house as, um, as having self-contained amenities and services, an option to be grid connected. Not everybody wants to be um, grid connected, but if they do, then um, that's obviously a lot more affordable for them. And we're saying that a tiny house, from our perspective, is a movable um, tiny house, is a transportable structure with the ability to be moved. That's the, an example here on, on the skid. And a tiny house on wheels is constructed on a trailer designed to meet road legal dimensions which can be moved. The um, foundation, the trailers, as I mentioned earlier, under our National Vehicle Standards Bulletin, VSB1, trailers um, that are <clears throat> for trailers great, not greater than 4.5 tonnes of trailer mass, um, they... Um, or oh, sorry, they they this VSB ones um, addresses trailers when they're under four point five tons of greater of um, four point five tons of aggregate trailer mass. But when they're over that, they need to be engineer designed. And this v, VSB one does not come into effect. That is when they're going oversize, when they're over two point five meters in width, if they're um, over four point three meters in height, and if they're over twelve meters in length. All of those <clears throat> take them out of the VSB1. And also the v, when you are building on a skid, then you also need to have that um, skid engineer designed. Um, what we're focused on is having a structural, we want to make sure that the connection between the roof, the wall and the, and the um, chassis um, or, the, or the floor is all connected and seamless. So there's a couple of examples here. In this example here on the far right-hand side, we've actually got just a, a mock-up of a timber frame construction. It could equally have also been a steel frame construction. But we've got steel rods that you can have steel rods that go from the, the top plate to the bottom plate, um, you know, through the frame and also the, the roof structure. This is an example of what I build. Um, we build, my business builds um, SIPs structural insulated panels. So I've got a C-channel uh, welded right around the perimeter beam of the trailer um, and then I sit, my, sit some of the SIP within that and then, and then overlap it and then I bolt all the way through from the outside to the inside and through the, um, through the steel seal C-channel and so it's extremely secure. And then on my um, roof systems, I've got 180 millimetre long um, connectors that drill um, connect all the way through, as well as a whole range of other systems as well. They've been extremely and really, really secure. So we all need to take responsibility about site preparation really seriously. And when as we have a stormwater, when we have a rain event, we need to manage our stormwater runoff properly. That is collating it into a spot so that we are not causing, you know, overland flow, we call it. Um, and that overland flow goes on to somebody else's property and causes a nuisance. That is illegal here. Um, you have to maintain your stormwater on your property, just like um, wastewater runoff as well. Maintain and then put it through the, um, the pipe network. We also need to have good subfloor ventilation systems so that allows that good air circulation under the subfloor to reduce mould. We really um, are encouraging that or we want through our guide that all structural drawings are prepared either by the manufacturer, it might be a prefab company um, or it might be some other, you know, um, seal supplier 
and then it's certified by a structural engineer where relevant and applicable to um, if it's timber or steel framing then there's a schedule that um, it's it's designed to obviously if it's a sip then a sip wall and ring system then it's designed to the manufacturer's um, specifications but we also recognize that there are maybe other alternative framing systems maybe not just yet but in the future um, because most of us will be building with timber or steel or, or zips. And the bracing and the tie-down details have to be engineer designed as well because the bracing and that tie-down is absolutely critical to make sure that it's safe when it's being moved on the road, um, as well as when we have, um, in, if you're in a, cyclo a cyclonic area. The other day in, in New South Wales, we actually had two to, three tornadoes. We don't have tornadoes. In Australia and in Melbourne the other day we actually had an earthquake as a um, factor five uh, level five level six earthquake which again we don't have really weird New Zealand's trying to come in underneath our um, under our stable continental shelf and causing us a bit of disruption so there's some computations that we need to ensure that are occurring and this is what we build you know timber and steel and sips I'm sure most of you are building something along those lines. Now, sheet roofing, I'm talking about sheet roofing. I'm not talking about um, tile roofing because obviously the weight, but I think in, it's in the US you might have other roofing materials, but generally speaking, most of the roofing on tiny houses because of the weight will be sheet roofing. There is ways to connect it safely to ensure that um, that it doesn't become a weapon as it's being transported along the road and that it doesn't become a weapon in the event of, you know, a wind, you know, a high rain, high wind event. So there are elements within the BCA. Um, the, the BCA is also interchangeably with the National Construction Code um, that we need to adhere to about our securing and what sort of, um, what sort of, uh, a screws we need to use and and frequency of that as well then we've got gutters and downpipes again you know uh, we need to be aware of the impact of the width if we're building at 2.5 meters wide which is the maximum width accessible on the road then any projections beyond that such as a gutter will will put us out of that limit so we need to be aware of that maybe there's a way that you can transport it without the gutter and, and, and relocate it um, on the site when you get to the site. Same as most most people might be using timber cladding, they might be using uh, weather, uh, sorry, uh, steel cladding. So again, if we're using whatever cladding we're using, there needs to be a process of connection, a safe connection of that cladding onto the frame system, whether it be steel or timber frame system. With the structural floor, uh, that needs to be engineer designed. We need to make sure that it's going to, whatever flooring that we're going to put down is going to support the intended weight. We call it dead weight and live, uh, dead load and live load. Live load is us, the people and our furniture. The dead load is the other materials going on top of it. And, um, you know, such as, uh, you know, the walling system, the, the internal walls and doors, the framing, and also the roofing, so that's called the dead load. Now, glazing is an interesting one for people because a lot of people, especially if they're DIYs, they're wanting to use second-hand windows. However, in, our, in in Australia, we've got two standards that they um, that, that we address. One is for pretty much new windows, but if you're using second-hand windows, then you need to comply with what we call Australian Standard 1288. The new one, they're really AS 2047. No matter what, the focus of the windows is designed to be thermally efficient, to be waterproof and to be safe for in the intended use. It also covers off on the windows that are intended in wet areas, such as your shower, um, you know, your shower screens. If anybody's using shower screens, you won't want to use the same, you need to use toughened or laminated glass in those shower screens because in a wet area, um you if you slip you 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 would be fall, you might be falling against that screen and you can't have um the shards of glass you know cause that injury just the same as you know our windscreens our car windscreens these days and have been laminated 
um, you know, for a very long time. <clears throat> so that issue about the secondhand windows is a bit of an issue for or that that point about the secondhand windows is a bit of an issue for a lot of DIYs. Um, because it's complicated for how the, how do they get tested, um, you know, that they are still um, reasonable. Now, they might be three mil, three mil pane glass and I wouldn't put anything in less than what we call four mil um, thickness of glass just because of the, the rigidity. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of movement as we take the, you know, tiny houses along the freeway. There's a lot of movement um, and wind pressure loads and you want to make sure that that glass is as thick as possible um, but obviously also every time you increase the size of, of an, any element, you also increase the weight as well. Now, this is going to be an interesting one for some of you here because a lot of people really love the skylights, and I do too. However, if that skylight for us or if a window for us is above two metres above the ground, and I know people are talking about them and using them as fire escapes, but, you know, we don't need to do that here in Australia. But we would need to limit that opening by one to 125 millimetres, which is only the size of a baby's head, right? And the reason being is because so, and, and any any of our windows that are over that two metres above the ground needs to be restricted to that 125, so that these little little these little ones don't fall out. Okay. Other things, if we've got information about fire protection, um, you know, 10-year photo, photoelectric smoke alarm and dry powder extinguisher and, and if you do have gas, which most people will have gas in their tiny house, either for cooking mostly, maybe for the hot water service, but that should be outside, um, you know, there is requirements of ventilation, uh, you know, to um, where it's got to be placed and, and how it's got to be ventilated. Also, any flames, we are not able to put any any um, cooking flame in front of a window unless it's a toughened window. So, um, you know, I've seen lots of photos of tiny houses, you know, where their kitchen is and where their cooking area is and, you know, most of them, a lot of them are, tend to be in front of windows. Um, that's okay for us if it's a toughened glass, if it's actually designed for that, for heat-resistant glass, but it's most of them probably wouldn't be. And another thing I've seen, lots of people having um, fireplaces, and, look, I was really excited when I did, when I built my first tiny house, I, you know, got um, the little cube, cube mini, I think it was, uh, um, from Canada and, you know, waited for three months to bring it over and then I tried to get somebody to install it. That, that I couldn't get anybody to install it because it didn't have um, this Australian standard 2918. It wasn't compliant with that. So, um, you know, I couldn't install it. So you just got to be careful that if you, the, these standards are designed for our benefit. They're designed for us. Make sure that what's being put onto the market is safe, um, as safe as practically possible. So that's... Keep that in mind if you do need, if you are thinking about a fireplace, you know, trying to get one that's, you know, got a US standard or an ISO standard for it. Um, but I, I use, in my tiny houses now, I use infrared heaters, um, which are really, really efficient, really low wattage demand, and but also, of course, no naked flame. There's no moving parts. It's just an infrared heater. If we've got LP gas, which everybody will pretty much have, we need to have that in accordance with a certain area about where it should be installed, where the gas um, uh, um, bottles need to be installed, not allowed to be installed on the corner. They've got to be mo moved inwards from a corner by a certain distance. A lot of these things people don't know about. Um, we're also seeking bathroom and ceiling and kitchen heights of no of, 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 of no less than two metres. Now, some people who are a lot shorter than that might say, well, hang on, I don't need two metres. Well, if you're wanting to get a building permit, that's what we're looking for. We know that we can try to get dispensation around you no know, less than two metres. Our standard is 2.1, so it's just a little bit less than that, less than the standard. and. Everybody's got 
most people, when there's a loft, you call it a bed bedroom or bed area. For us here in Australia, we're changing that terminology to bed platform, like a bunk, just like a bunk, because we all know that and through your Appendix Q, um, you know, and we've used that in our guide as well, the um, steps are, are steeper in our tiny house when you're getting to a, um, a loft because of the smaller footprint of the tiny house and you can't have the normal standard, um, what we call rising and going. And as a result of oh, this, you know, the stair rises and the treads it's, itself. As a result of that, we've tried to bring it down a bit, but we can still overcome it by just talking about it as a bunk as opposed to an actual sleeping area. That helps us achieve that. Some of the sorts of things that we can we need to incorporate in a dwelling for us is a kitchen with facilities for preparation, bath, a shower, toilet, washing machine, a wash basin. You could also have a washing machine, which would which would compensate for that. And also, from a safety perspective, if somebody's in the toilet and they have a heart attack, or if they're in the shower and they have a heart attack and they fall down, they need to have at least 1.2 meters in front of the the toilet or in the shower. Um, so that in the event of that, somebody can still open the door and get them out. It's really, really important. Most people building tiny will have um, sliding doors, maybe bifold, but, you know, opening doors is a waste of space in tiny houses. We've also got something about 10% of the floor area needs to be lit. We've also got, if you've got a sanitary area, off the food kitchen area, then it needs to have an exhaust fan discharging to the exterior. And of course, of course, cooking appliances using combustible fuels needs to be exhausted um, outside. External venting for kitchens um, is a really good practice because also reduces condensation. The amount of condensation that generates um, in a house when you uh, have not got your exhaust fan is really considerable. And that mold, that condensation can end up in your in your building materials and cause health impacts down the track. We don't want that. Oh, and um, just one other thing, sorry. Hmm. This must have clicked the wrong one. Yeah, and then we've got some we've got some stair designs. I don't expect you to read those dimensions, but we've got opportunities for landings, um, which is where a lot of people like to, you know, put beside their sleeping platform and, you know, rest their legs on a normal, you know, um, 90 degree angle and take off their shoes or whatever and then pop into bed. So we've got a few different designs here, but overall, um, you know, they're just um, providing some guidance for people. Now, because, as I said earlier, in regards to Australia and the US particularly, you know, we're big countries. We've got really extreme temperatures. Um, and so we can't define, you know, exactly the level of insulation that should be required. Now, you notice that our, our, our values are significantly different to yours. Yours is a multiple of, I think, of about six or eight um times ours is like our, our our four bat will be something like about um 175 millimeters thick so pretty thick um anyway it's understood that when a thou um if there's no heating or cooling if, if the thou doesn't need heating or cooling in the construction, then it's an un, what we call an unconditioned space. And as a result of that, it doesn't require what we call an energy rating that is otherwise required for all houses, no matter where new houses and also reno, big renovation projects, no matter where it's being built across Australia. So what we, though, have done is provide at least a minimum requirement, you know, saying, you know, at least walls should be having an R value of two, Roofs should be an R value of four subfloor, um, because of the um, cool, en cool the entry of the cool, and also the release of the heat. Also, to have an R value of one, and external glazing should be at least um, have a thickness of four millimeters. And if you, I mine, I design double glazed, thermally broken double glazed windows. 
uh, for my areas because I typically build in um, Victoria, but other people might just have what we call low E glass, which is low emissivity glass, helping to reduce the heat entry. That would be particularly important for areas where there is um, um, where it's a, where you spend more money cooling the home. And lastly, we've also got a wastewater management guide that's under development at the moment. One of our members has taken, who, who's been working in the wastewater management area in composting toilets, particularly for the last 35 years, has taken this job on for us to develop a wastewater management guide. It is nearly at its completion. It has been a hugely complex um, issue because we've got um, six different EPAs in each state and territory, and they require, they oversee the management of wastewater or the development of wastewater management um, policies and procedures. But then the local councils, which there are 535 across Australia, are involved in the implementation of the guide and everybody has a different um, understanding of an implementation of those policies and procedures. So it's been an absolute challenge um, trying to get some sort of sense of consistency and even people in the same council or in the same state have different interpretations um, of this. So, you know, we hope to be able to launch our guide in the coming weeks and we'll obviously be posting it up on our website. I'm really excited. I've seen Janet here, Janet Thoem, and from the US Tiny House Alliance. And hi, Janet. And I'm really pleased to say that um, Atha has been involved in um, the preliminary discussions of the development of an ASTM committee um, for tiny house construction and that our guide is, um, along with the Appendix Q, will start to form the, um, the basis of the um, tiny house construction um, standard and obviously it's just the basis. There's a lot of people that are going to be having input into that process, which I'm really excited about. And, you know, Janet's been doing an incredible job with bringing um, stakeholders together. So that's me. We've got a QR code for our website. If you would like, I'll leave that there for just a second if anybody wants to, you know, take a photo of that. And um, I will stop that screen and see now if I'll do that and stop that um stop i whoops who dies where did i go? Hmm. oh i think that right okay so hopefully that was of interest to you um and yeah Sorry, I've gone over time. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Has anybody got any questions? Well, I can have your mic. Oops. None? All right. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody and um, enjoy your tiny house journey. Thank you.